Now, anatomically, of course, we divide the nervous system into the central and the peripheral nervous system. Physiologically, though, some of the nervous system is under the control of our will. We decide we want to move something and we can move it. But many functions are automatically controlled in the body. We don't have to think about it. So I don't need to think, well, I had my tea about an hour ago. It's time I squeeze my pyloric sphincter or squeeze the pyloric area in my stomach, relax my pyloric sphincter and ejected some food into the duodenum for further processing. I don't need to think of all that because it's taken care of automatically. And the part of the nervous system that takes care of things automatically is the autonomic nervous system. So automatic, autonomic. And there are two components to the autonomic nervous system. There's the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And we're going to look at what they do on various physiological functions and anatomical structures in the body. But first, let's notice that the parasympathetic nervous system is sometimes called the craniosacral nervous system. That's because the parasympathetic flow from the brain out to the body and from the body back to the brain is via the cranial nerves and the sacral nerves way down in the base of the vertebral column. So it's the cranial nerves 3, which is the ocular motor, 7, which is the facial nerve, 9, which is the glossopharyngeal, and 10, which is the vagus nerve. So that's the cranial part, and the sacral part is the sacral nerve pairs 2, 3, and 4. So parasympathetic, craniosacral, down at the bottom. The sympathetic is called the thoracolumbar. So the sympathetic nerves leave the spine via the thoracic nerves and via the lumbar nerves. And all of the nerve pairs from T1, thoracic nerve pair 1, all the way down to L3, lumbar nerve pair 3, are sympathetic. So there is an anatomical division between the craniosacral and the thoracolumbar. But let's think about what they do. So what I want to do is think about what the sympathetic nervous system does. As opposed to what the parasympathetic <coughs> does. So what should we think of first? <coughs> well, an obvious place to start, perhaps, is with the um, heart. Now, the sympathetic is described as the fight or flight nervous system. It prepares us for fighting or for flighting, for running away. Whereas the parasympathetic is sometimes described as the rest and digest nervous system. It promotes rest and digestion and urination, in fact. <clears throat> now the heart, if we're going to fight or flight, we need the heart rate to be faster. So this will increase the rate and we'll get a tachycardia. And also it will increase the strength of contraction. So it will increase stroke volume. Stroke volume will increase. And if all these things are happening, if the heart's working faster, the myocardium is working harder, then it's going to need an increased blood supply. So sympathetic stimulation will also vasodilate the coronary arteries. But when we're resting, we don't need a tachycardia. We don't want a very large stroke volume. We don't need the coronary arteries to be dilated. So parasymp parasympathetic stimulation via the vagus nerve is going to decrease rate decrease stroke volume and allow the coronary arteries to constrict again. So effects on the heart. 
And then also fairly obviously when we're in a difficult situation, there's going to be effects on the lungs and on respiratory function. So if we need to fight or flight, the sympathetic stimulation is going to increase respiratory rate. The rate will be increased. And as well as the rate increasing, we'll breathe deeper. It will increase the volume of breathing. And if we want more air to get to the alveoli, the bronchial passages need to be wider. So sympathetic stimulation will cause bronchodilation. making the bronchial passages wider. The parasympathetic nervous system, again, will pretty well do the opposite. It will lower respiratory rate. It will lower respiratory volumes. And it will bring about constriction of the bronchial passages. Because when we're at rest, we don't want the bronchial passages to be wide open because that will let infection in. So when we can, we want the bronchial passages to be relatively closed. So the parasympathetic will cause bronchoconstriction. Bronchoconstrictive effects. Now, another interesting organ to consider is the kidneys. Now, sympathetic stimulation will tend to reduce urine volumes. So sympathetic stimulation will constrict, it will constrict the renal arteries, reducing blood supply to the kidneys. That's also good because it will leave more blood left over for the skeletal muscles. So sympathetic stimulation is going to vasoconstrict the renal arteries. And if you reduce the blood supply to the kidney, what's that going to do to the glomerular filtration rate? Well, if there's less blood flowing through the glomeruli, I think you can see there's going to be a lowered glomerular filtration rate. So GFR, glomerular filtration rate will go down. And this is good because this is going to conserve the amount of water in the body. Because in a fight or flight situation, we need water in the body to keep the blood volumes adequate to maintain the circulation. And in fact, sympathetic stimulation will also stimulate the release of renin, which stimulates the renin angiotensin mechanism to increase blood pressure and conserve sodium. And sympathetic stimulation will also increase the reabsorption of sodium from the renal tubules. Now, if you reabsorb more sodium from the renal tubules, you're going to get more sodium in the blood. Sodium is osmotic, so it's going to attract more water. And again, we can see this is vital to maintain the volume of the blood to maintain intravascular volume in order to maintain blood pressure. Because we need an adequate blood pressure to take effective fighting or flighting action. Parasympathetic will do the opposite. <clears throat> Parasympathetic will vasodilate the renal arteries and it will increase glomerular filtration rate. So urine production is parasympathetic. Sympathetic is going to reduce urine volumes. Parasympathetic is going to increase urine volumes. That's good because when we're at rest, we can maintain good osmoregulatory balance. Now what about the GI tract? Now, when there's sympathetic stimulation, we need all the blood for the heart, the lungs and the muscles. So we don't want lots of blood going to the gastrointestinal tract. 
because the gastrointestinal tract has a massive vasculature and could easily just take huge volumes of the amount of available blood. But to fight or flight, we need that blood to go to the heart, the lungs and the muscles. So sympathetic stimulation is going to vasoconstrict. the vessels going to the gastrointestinal tract. Conversely, parasympathetic activity is going to vasodilate, taking more blood to the gastrointestinal tract. And as well as that, the parasympathetic activity is going to increase the motility of the gastrointestinal tract. So during parasympathetic activity, remember parasympathetic is rest, digest and urinate. The blood vessels have dilated, there's going to be more motility of the muscles in the gastrointestinal tract, facilitating gastrointestinal peristalsis. And also parasympathetic activity will increase the secretions going into the gastrointestinal tract. So parasympathetic activity will increase saliva, it will increase gastric secretions, pancreatic secretions. All of those secretions will be increased by parasympathetic activity. So GI activity is very parasympathetic. The gastrointestinal tract is parasympathetically innervated. And while we're talking about the GI tract, it's interesting to think about the liver. Now, if we're going to fight or flight, are we going to need lots of readily available energy? Obviously we are. So in the liver, there's going to be gluco neolysis. That is, glycogen stored in the liver is going to be broken down into soluble glucose to increase the amount of glucose in the blood. So in sympathetic activity, when someone's stressed, sympathetic over there, parasympathetic, when someone's stressed, that's going to increase their blood sugar levels. In fact, we use this as one of our sepsis criteria. When the body is stressed by infection, the blood sugar will rise. And as well as that, as well as breaking down the stored glycogen to glucose, the liver will also release stored fats to produce energy. That's called lipolysis. And this is important because fats contain a lot of energy, especially if the fight or flight situation goes on for a long time. So if we're being chased by the enemy tribe, we could need to run away for hours, in which case we'd need energies from fats. So the liver is very important in maintaining the metabolic requirements of the body during this fight or flight sympathetic emergency situation. Conversely, the parasympathetic activity will tend to deposit, it will tend to convert the glucose to the glycogen and deposit glycogen into the liver and deposit more fats into the liver. So parasympathetic is going to increase the production of glycogen from glucose, increase the deposition of fats. Now what about the, uh, the surface of the body, the skin? Well, sympathetic activity. If someone gets a fright, we say, what's the matter with you? You look white, you look, you look like you've seen a ghost or something because they've gone pale. Harder to see in dark skin, but you can see it in the lips and the mucous membranes. Because what's happening with sympathetic activity is sympathetic activity is causing peripheral vasoconstriction, reducing the blood supply to the surface of the body. Now this is good because the skin can last for quite a long time without a uh, corpious blood supply. So the peripheral vasoconstriction to the surface of the body is good because that leaves more blood left over for the skeletal muscles, for the heart, for the lungs and for the vital fight or flight functions. 
But it's also good because in a fight or flight situation, it's not unlikely we're going to be injured. So when we're anxious, we might be injured. We might go through a patch of brambles when we're being chased, or we might be injured by a predator or an enemy tribe. We could be injured. And if we're going to be injured on the surface of the body, we're going to lose much less blood if we are already peripherally vasoconstricted. So as well as leaving more blood left over for the vital organs, it's also brilliant because it means we lose less blood if we're injured. And of course, the last thing you want to do in a fight or flight situation is lose blood. We want to maintain intravascular volumes so we can maintain blood pressure. So skin sympathetic is vasoconstriction. And parasympathetic activity will allow the vessels to dilate. And at the same time, sweating. <clears throat> now, sympathetic activity is going to increase the amount of sweat that is produced. It's going to increase the amount of sweat. And you know this if you're in a tense situation, all of a sudden you can feel sweat running down from your armpits and you can feel sweaty. And we call it a cold sweat. Anxiety, emergency situations will cause a cold sweat. The sweat is cold because we're sweating more, but the surface of the body is cold because of the peripheral vasoconstriction. So why do we have a cold sweat? Well, when you live in northern latitudes, it is a bit of a mystery. But you've got to remember that human beings are tropical animals. We are designed to survive in the tropics. And if you're in the tropics, the ambient temperature is probably 35 degrees centigrade. So the body temperature is already quite adequate. But in the fight or flight situation, we need to fight or we need to run away. And both of those produce an awful lot of heat. And that would cause a hyperthermia. And when the body temperature rises, the efficiency of the enzymes is reduced massively. And if your enzymes aren't working, you can't produce your energy and you would be caught by the rival tribe and you would be killed or you would be caught by the predator. So the sweating is very important to preempt the hyperthermia that would occur, especially in the tropics, caused by the muscular activity caused by the fight or flight sympathetic reaction. So sympathetic is important in that situation. And the converse, the parasympathetic, is going to reduce sweating. So that will increase the sweating. Now I've run out of space, but there are other things we could mention. Uh, sexual activity is one of them. You might expect erectile function to be sympathetic, but it's not, it's actually parasympathetic. So penile and indeed clitoral erections are both parasympathetic. Um, but actually ejaculation is a, is a sympathetic activity. So what we've done is looked at various activities in the body, shown that the sympathetic stimulation prepares us for flight or flight because we are designed to survive in difficult emergency situations. But there again, once we've got over the fight or flight, we need to rest, digest and urinate. And that's when we need the parasympathetic activity to control that aspect of the autonomic nervous system. So in you, most of the time at the moment, these two things are going on and hopefully we're at a fairly even physiological homeostasis for most of the time due to the relative activity of these branches of the autonomic nervous system.